Exercise autophagy and longevity. This is a continuation video for the previous video you have seen. If you haven't watched this video, I suggest watching it first because I want to clarify certain things that I felt I did not clarify well. Now, let's start. Welcome to the Wellness Messiah podcast. I'm your host, Riman. This is a question from Ed White. Since fasting is good and exercise is good as well, how about combining them together and exercising while fasting? Okay, so fasting is one way to stretch the body and activate autophagy, and exercise is another way. And indeed, if you exercise when you fast, you're gonna kick in autophagy stronger and deeper, indeed. However, you need to be careful that you don't uh, stress your body too much. There was one day that I combined fasting, high intensity exercise, and sauna. Sauna is another way to stress the body, right, with heat. And what happens after 20 minutes in the sauna, I simply fainted. It was too much stress on my body. So we need to be careful with combining too many stress uh, on our bodies. There is so much our bodies can take. And in this position, it's not going to lead to longevity as well. So remember what I said in the video about this Chinese proverb. Choking yourself to death won't help you to live longer. So we need to see how our body feels when we use multiple stressors. But the idea of using fasting and exercise could enhance autophagy. But I don't want to say anything that is going to hurt you. So please consult your doctor and listen to your body with everything that you said. It's your personal choice. And I'm never again is going to combine fasting, sauna, and high-intensity training the same day. This study from 2017 compared mortality rates between different types of Olympic athletes. The study is called Differences in Life Expectancy Between Olympic High Jumpers, Discus Throwers, Marathon, and 100-Meter Runners. I'm quoting, We identified a death rate for 336 athletes, 229 males and 100-plus females. They did not check mortality for female marathon runners. Now, you know who lived the longest? Let's see in the graph. As you can see in this graph, the high jumpers had a significantly lower mortality than the rest of the groups. But what is more interesting is that as we progress with time, the high jumpers defeated all the other groups in longevity, both men and women. Another clarification is about the study of the Olympic athletes. And the first thing I want to say about the study is that this study is not the best study for longevity in a sense that Olympic athletes do not maximize longevity benefits. They train to improve performance. You don't have their problem. Therefore, they are not a very good model for perfect exercise for longevity, but they are an excellent model to how the same exercise repetitively in a supervised control way can actually lead to different mortality results. So what I'm saying here that the type of exercise does matter. Another caveat in this situation is that most of these athletes, Olympic athletes, they usually train for 20, 25 years, usually let's say from age 10 or 8 until 30, 35, somewhere in that range. And this means that we don't know their entire life's exercise routine, but we may know about a third of that, and that's good enough for our purposes. And the group is almost 400 uh, athletes. So it's very interesting study to look at. However, it's not one-to-one -one translation to our situation. This is my point. Now, the big question, based on my video, you would expect the sprinters to live the longest, right? Because they use high-intensity training. So why don't they live the longest? Why is it the high jumpers? The first thing to remember here is that all Olympic athletes use the maximum frequency. I'm not a big fan of intense exercise and high frequency as you have seen in my video. So excess intensity in this situation could be problematic for the longevity and health. Even more so because of their high frequency. The 100 meter sprinters, they have a rather heavy physique. They're not as heavy as bodybuilders, but they are heavier than the rest of the athletes. And ideally, for longevity, we want efficient muscles. We don't want heavy muscles. One reason that we don't want heavy muscles is that you must eat excess protein to achieve this result. And this is going to activate mTOR, insulin, and others. And this is going to accelerate aging. In other words, it's impossible 
to have this amount of muscle mass, heavy muscle mass, without high protein diet. Now let's compare sprinters with the high jumpers who live the longest. They have to be rather fit and lean to jump high. This suggests the best balance between weight and strength, per definition. I mean, otherwise they won't be able to jump as high. Another interesting distinction is sprinting for 100 meters all the time as a training is extremely intense for humans. It's too intense and it's going to cause unnecessary muscle damage. And remember, the frequency is already very high. So you couple that with a very intense exercise and this combination is not as good and healthy for longevity. Now let's think about the high jumpers. They sprint several meters, jump, and curve their body. That sounds like high intensity interval training. It's not too intense. And plus they must cover and engage all muscles. And they keep the ratio between strength to body weight pretty high. They are very strong for their weight. And physical strength together with lower weight is associated with longevity. And another interesting point that I did not mention in the video. I heard Ori Offmeckler from the Warrior Diet and he also researched longevity and exercise connection. And he found that fast muscle fiber, they correlate with longevity, but not the super fast muscle fiber. Now, I could not find studies on this subject to corroborate what he said, but it makes sense to me from a metabolic perspective. Activating mainly the super fast muscle fiber without balancing it, it causes the muscles to burn only sugar, not fat. And this correlates negatively with aging. And 100 meter sprinters engage their super fast muscle fibers all the time. Instead, I think we need to focus more on the fast muscle twitch and maybe a bit on the super fast. I think we need to try to step down from the super fast, highest paced activities necessarily. And I was a bit amiss because in the video, I, I stated the word sprinting as the best, uh, one of the best longevity activities. And in my mind, I thought about sprinting not in the sense of a hundred meter sprinter, but more in a healthier runner where we can run in a gradually increasing speeds for a few minutes and then stop resting and then again running in a increasing speeds for and do that for three or four repetitions. So that's it really, nothing beyond that. And I call this sprinting and it's I, I was amiss to use that. So let's focus on doing things fast, not necessarily super fast. And if we do engage in super fast, which I think is fine, we only do that for a few seconds, you see? So if we, we run and we want to put the maximum stress, I think it's okay for a few seconds uh, one, two, to increase the maximum speed. But I, I don't think that should be the, the main menu in our exercise routine. So the bottom line is this. The goal is to use intense exercise, not too intense exercise and infrequently. And having a super strong physique with a relatively low body weight. This fits well with longevity research and this fits well as well with jumpers and not sprinters. I didn't mention a rule of thumb that I have. How do I know that the exercise I've been doing, the high intensity exercise I've been doing was intense enough, but not too intense? Is having muscle soreness, what is called domes, after the exercise when your muscles, they, they ache a bit. If you have it one day after the exercise, but not after one day, it suggests small amount of damage, which is good. So that could be a good indication you used a very good intensity. You don't have to feel this muscle soreness, but I, my rule of thumb is one day is, is okay. Having more than one day, at this point, I'm transitioning into a large muscle damage, which could promote muscle growth if I'm going to eat high protein diet. But this is not pro longevity. This is not your preservation. It's more like for growth. So my rule of thumb is maximum amount of one day of muscle soreness. And this rule of thumb came from many years of tracking my body weight. And I noticed that when I achieve more than one day, then I have to eat high protein diet to recover from this exercise. Otherwise, I'm going to lose muscle mass. I'm going to uh, achieve apoptosis. This is not good. So I'm not telling you this based on my ide ideology, simply based on my experimentation and measurements with my body. And when I wanted to build muscle mass, usually have muscle soreness for five, sometimes six days. So if you have trained very hard on your legs, you know that the legs could have a painful impact for four, three, five days. So this suggests not necessarily the right intensity, but too much intensity, which has a proclivity to increase muscle mass if you're going to eat excess protein. But in the everyday use that you want to preserve your muscle mass, it's unnecessary.
how many exercises am I doing? For important muscles, I do incorporate two types of exercises. For example, I'm doing two types of back exercises that stress the muscles in a bit different ways. And I can do both of them at the same session, or I can divide them. Anyhow, I do them once every two weeks. And today, and that could change, I have about 11 to 12 exercises in total that I do each once every two weeks. This includes the aerobics aspect of it, which is not easy for me because I'm injured. With my aerobics, I'm doing high intensity interval training and I'm using the recumbent stationary bike. About 15 years ago, I got injured. And because of that, I can't really run. That would be my ideal exercise for now. So what I'm doing, I'm using the recliner bicycle. And what I like about the reclining bicycle, it doesn't apply a lot of pressure on my joints, which means that I can continue with this exercise for my entire life. Because, you know, there is some notion that after age 40 or 50, you don't want to run because the recovery rate of your joints is going down. So that's what I do. It also uh, activates my large muscles in the legs. And it also increases my heartbeat. So that's what I do personally. The biggest challenge I found with implementing this strategy is the mental challenge, continuing with high intensity without cheating once every two weeks for every muscle. Because it's very easy to do lower intensity, which is easier, especially that you don't do the exercise every day. Sometimes we forget how to use the muscle. So what I found is I need to do some warm up to remind myself after two weeks how to do the exercise properly without cheating with proper form. And I'm sure there are going to be exercise experts that will say that everything I do is wrong. It could be. But listen, I care about longevity. If I can activate autophagy intensely in every muscle in our body every two weeks, and I can keep my muscle mass, strength, and speed, for me, this is the minimum amount of damage for maximum longevity. And what I also like about this strategy is that it saves me a bunch of time. This is very important. This is my body not yours. And you need to track your body too and consult your doctor about the intensity. And my routine may not work for you. Maybe you don't care about saving time. Do you want more information about my exercise routine? Then I published two years ago a podcast. It was about 40 minute podcast episode that expands on my individual exercise every two weeks routine. And I'm going to put a link for that in the description. Now, the last section of today, let's see the big picture because exercise is not everything in longevity. So we need to see how exercise fits to our entire longevity strategy. This leads me to the 10 commandments of longevity. 